Hey everybody, Rose Matter here. Welcome to part 5 of my Higurashi When They Cry to Tarugarashi Let's Play. So it got real in the last episode. There was a lot of implications about, you know, um, child neglect, child abuse. It looks like Sadako is living with her uncle who's come back from Okinomiya. And it's not a good situation. And as Mion kept implying, there's not really anything that can be done. But of course, Keiichi probably isn't going to let that stop him. He's probably going to do something because he is her new Nini and he has to protect Sadako at all costs. So it, it's, uh, it's delving into some real stuff right now. And I am a little nervous about what, how much worse it's going to get. But uh, we got to do it. So let's get into it. I walked forward quite a ways, then turned right where the rice fields ended. I'd never come here before, so I had no idea where to go. I got lost several times, so I may have taken quite a long way around. Maybe I should have gone back home and gotten my bike first. It would have made everyone else worry if I'd asked them, so I asked one of our other classmates where Sadako's actual house was. Oh shit! Right off the bat, he is going in and he is checking out what's going on. I knew Keiichi wasn't going to be the type to just let things just, you know, hope for the best, hope for a miracle. He's going to go and he's going to make that miracle happen. That house was originally her family's, apparently, not their uncle and, and his wives. Their house had been bigger, so they had taken it for themselves. Right here. Several houses all in a line. Over there? I was visiting Sadako's house, but I didn't particularly intend to meet her there. I didn't mean to spy on the enemy, her mean uncle, either. Maybe I just wanted to be a little closer to her, as her nini. Pretty words, but I didn't know if they were true. If what Tomatakuna and the others told me was right, it would be this house? When I recognized it, my feet grew heavy. What did I come here for? My motive for coming here was absurd. When Mion had said at the end that we were powerless... It made me sort of frustrated. I just wanted to do something, anything other than waste the days away praying for a miracle. That's what made me come here. But that was all. Even if I, I were to witness her uncle actually tormenting Sadako, what could I do? Would I act like a comic book hero, punch the guy in the face and take Sadako away with me? And then live together somewhere far away? That was ridiculous. Oh, the cicada's voices, raised in chorus, sounded like they were scoffing at me. As though they were saying that if I couldn't do anything and wouldn't do anything, then I should go back home. I heard a car approaching, so I got out of its way. But the car stopped right behind me, its horn honking shortly once. Oh gee, I wonder who this could be. Could it be Oishi? Annoyed, hadn't I gotten out of their way? I looked behind me, and a familiar face was looking at me out the driver's side window. Our coach! Okay. Konnichiwa, me being here wasn't normal. Just as I considered somehow giving him the slip, I noticed Sadako sitting in the passenger seat. Sadako? Aww. Sadako got out of the car and began unloading a lot of groceries from the trunk. Oh, she's not even trying to put on a happy face. It's just like all the light has been drained from her eyes. As Coach spoke, he pulled Sadako's bike from out the back seat where they'd put it. The grocery bags were big, and there were four of them. They all seemed to be packed full and very heavy. I looked at the bags and saw they were filled to the brim with sake bottles, snacks you'd eat with sake, and boxes with, of cigarettes. I guess back in the day, children could just go in and get cigarettes. I mean, I've heard it from... Uh, you know, for my parents about how lax things were back in the day, but this is like the 80s. This wasn't that long. Well, I mean, I guess it was. Oh, boy. It's like that was that was actually quite a while ago. But still, it just blows my mind that, that a store would just sell a child cigarettes. 
Their weight was one thing, but their contents were nothing less than luxury items. Sadako gave Coach a smile filled with gratitude. But it was incredibly awkward and even heartrending. I didn't even think about the sake. They sold her alcohol and cigarettes. He, he made Sadako go to a distant store by herself on her bike. So she could buy dumb shit like this? Oh, he's probably gonna storm in and have words with this guy. And what was the uncle doing right now anyway? He must have been working up a good sweat at this very moment if he needed to send Sadako out by herself, right? If not, then how much, how much had Sadako suffered for no reason? I hadn't intended to voice my feelings, but <laughs> that's basically the Keiichi way. I didn't mean to blurt out, blurt out what I said, but I did it anyway. But they may have made it into my face. Coach might have noticed because he clapped me on the shoulder. Just then, one of the house windows clattered open, and the face of a vulgar man, the very sight of which made me immediately avert my eyes, emerged from within it. There was no self-introductions necessary. My gut told me this was the uncle in question. The first thing out of his mouth should have been words of gratitude for Sadako. Sadako! And it's so weird to see Sadako so... What's the word? Submissive? Sadako miserably apologized over and over, bowing again and again. She could be perfectly described as a small animal. I had no idea what was happening. Sadako finished shopping for all this heavy stuff that wasn't even for dinner. She only managed to come back because she ran into coach and he drove her home. She hadn't been found by him. She'd surely still be by herself, panting and moaning, pedaling her bicycle up that steep hill. What was with those words? Those horrible sleazy words that he said to Sadako? In what country's dictionary did it tell him to say such things? To a young girl who just finished shopping. My anger, of course, wouldn't reach him. The uncle displayed no interest in me, instead shouting at Coach. いえ、遠慮します。佐藤子ちゃんとは偶然お会いしたんで、ちょっとお送りしてあげただけです。すぐに失礼します。さあね、ちょっとぐらいやっててくださいね。先生、お金持ちじゃないですか。I didn't even understand what her uncle and coach were talking about, but I knew one thing for sure. None of what he just said uh, had been to thank Sadako in any way. Sadako. とっとと鍵も持ってこんかい。ビールも冷めてもうた。冷蔵庫から冷えてるの出してくれな。てっちゃん、娘に厳しすぎや。もうちょい言いたがらんと改善で。あんな娘にゃ、兄貴んちにい
And she probably won't get to eat anything, will she? Mahjong? He called his friends over for Mahjong? They were too busy playing, so they sent Sadako to buy them a crapload of booze from a faraway store. And the first thing he said to her was how she left the gas on? What the hell, what the hell, what the hell? Oh, there goes Keiichi, just not being able to control his emotions. I wonder if Keiichi's gonna burst in there and get beat up by the uncle and his friends. Even though Coach was listening, he pretended he wasn't. There was a line of heavy-looking shopping bags lined up on the ground next to the trunk. Okay, so we're going in, and I bet you Keiji's gonna have some words. Or he's gonna want to, but Coach will probably be like, no, 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 just don't, just stay out of it. Coach pretended he hadn't heard that violent outburst either. When I thought about it later, his reaction might have been the best thing he could do in that situation. The bags were packed to the brim with bottles of sake and bar snacks. They were so heavy. And so filthy, so unfair. They weren't just heavy in terms of weight. They made me feel mortified. Nothing could have been heavier than that. Sadako mistook my biting back the humili uh, humiliation as grimacing under the weight and offered to help. Sadako had never looked down on my physical strength in the slightest. No, not at all, answered Coach, smiling vaguely. Coolly. But I, and I alone, knew. Coach was an adult, so he just knew how to keep his feelings from showing. There was even more anger than I was feeling burning deep in his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. Shit. It wasn't very far to the doorstep of Sadako's house, but the bag squeezed my palms and started leaving red marks. Fury welled up in me, and the back of my throat stung. But even if it all came gushing out, it wouldn't solve anything. So, just tightly gritting my teeth was as much as I could do. After we carried them to the back door, Sadako said that was enough. Occasionally, we'd hear the repulsive laughter of her uncle and her friends from within and my insides would seethe. I knew they weren't rid uh, ridiculing us, and that was why it made me so mad. They'd made Sadako shop for all this heavy, selfish stuff, then ignored her and laughed amongst themselves as they pleased. It was deeply aggravating. Of course, Coach had to have felt the same way. But if he accidentally let his feelings slip onto his face, he'd only cause Sadako more worry. He knew all that, and spoke coolly, as if to say he didn't care. So I know I, I've been a little harsh on, on Coach for the last few episodes, but uh, you guys have let me know, you know, it's uh, just don't take it too seriously, the things that he says, and I'm, I'm trying to, you know, kind of give him a chance, he, and he does seem like he is being very genuine right now, so good on you, Coach. That he feels that way. Those words were sad. Sadako herself was sad and resigned that we could only help her so much. But she was right. No matter how much coach or I want to help Sadako, this was as much as we could do. I felt absolutely ashamed at not having the power to help her any more than this. Burning, boiling emotions were bubbling up within me and rising into my throat. 
trembling all over. I almost started to cry from my fury. I wanted to at least give her those trite words saying that I'd help her whenever she wanted. Aww, that little smile. Sadako seemed to have guessed what I was doing in a place like this, when my house was in the opposite direction from school. Well, that's all the more reason to not want to leave her alone. She felt guilty getting us involved after we'd helped her. Because she wanted to be the only one to suffer this misfortune. That's how it looked, and it hurt. I handed my supermarket bag over to Sadako. And then I noticed on the back of Sadako's hand, there was something that looked like a bruise. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oi, Sadako! Is this going to be the thing that pushes him over the edge? I knew as much as anyone else how transparent that sounded. I didn't need to hear it from Sadako to know how this bruise came to be. And the sad music, though, man, it's killing me. Coach nudged me in the back. And then he put his index finger to his mouth to chide me for being so loud. Yeah, Keiichi is not holding it back now. <laughs> the evening glow finally got to a point where I could see the other concealed oval-shaped bruises and traces of swelling. On her neck, and her legs, and other places too. <laughs> the very moment my violent, rampaging emotions were about to burst their way out of my throat, I found my mouth being tightly clamped down on. <laughs> Coach was pressing down on my mouth from behind, wrapping around me tightly with his hands. Because of that, I couldn't say anything. I could only groan, which I did. That was all I could do. I needed to expel all the magma sitting deep within me. Because otherwise I'd surely explode into a million pieces at that very moment. So I groaned. I groaned. From my mouth. From my whole body. While heat fell in drops from my eyes. Oh god, this is so sad. I groaned and groaned. I groaned to the point of exhaustion. <coughs> I wrung absolutely everything out of myself. Even having lost my voice, I was still wringing it all out. Endure it for now? And then what, huh? What would happen to her, to Sadako? Her body and mind were wounded, and she was being made to suffer like this. Can you not even, even let me howl in vain at it? Is that it, coach? Are we this powerless? So powerless we can't even fucking scream from the bottom of our hearts? The voices of the Higurashi made me calm down. I didn't know how long it had been. Sadako abruptly gave me a slight bow. ケイチさん。さとこ。ああ。ケイチさんが本当の兄にみたいに見えます。ああ、there's that flash of her usually, you know how she used to be. 
ニーニーがサトコきっと助けてやるからなサトシホシュ you fucking idiot if not now then when サトコ she's never been in more pain in her life if her ニーニー doesn't save her now then when will he why did you run away why did you abandon her see this is now he's all now he's all like Juiced up, and now he's probably gonna be even more like looking into what happened to Satoshi, and that's just gonna get him into more trouble. Why did you leave Sadako behind? You don't have any right to call yourself Sadako's Nini. Wow. Oh, yep, yep, that was not a good thing to say. Slip. Tears trickled from Sadako's eyes. And then she narrowed her eyes into a smile. Sayonara, Nini. Sadako took her right hand and awkwardly waved to me. I thought she was going to be upset with him for implying that he abandoned her. And Coach is like, I helped too. I helped. Oh, I hate this too. The fact that she says, I hope to see you tomorrow. I'll be okay. I'm just worried she's going to not show up to school one day and she's going to be dead. And I don't think I can handle that. There was no way I could say bye, see you tomorrow. And then from inside the house came a throaty, disgusting voice. Coach grabbed me by the collar, and with strength I couldn't have imagined him having, started dragging me away. And I, unable to oppose him, started getting farther away from Sadako. She waved her hand to us, expression still dark, and disappeared. Through the back door. He is not going to be happy with me. He's going to be like, you need to calm down. Coach got into the car first, then turned around on the narrow path and brought the passenger side door around for me. Maibara-san's気持ちは痛いくらいにわかります。いえ、Maibara-san以上にわかるつもりです。でも、今この場だけはこらえてください。あなたの心は <laughs> I meekly got into the passenger seat. The car accelerated quietly, and Sadako's house grew farther and farther away in the rear mirror. We made a wide turn, and then I couldn't see her house anymore. Eh? I didn't bother to reply. I would have been hard-pressed to give him an answer as to why I was at Sadako's house. Coach didn't say anything more, either. For a while, the two of us were silent. The only sounds from the gravel sprang over the road as we drove. I remembered how Rena said things were different last year. At the time, she had Satoshi with her. Satoshi protected Sadako, so that less of the sparks fell onto her. Coach seemed to understand what I really meant when I said that. It sounded like an excuse, but he was right. Even if Coach and I wanted to be people Sadako could depend on, that was all. 
It ended at the front door. No matter how much I shouted that I would be her Nini. No matter how much I shouted I wouldn't abandon her. And no matter how much Sadako called me Nini. I couldn't do any more than that. Satoshi was where did you go to the Right, Satoshi was another story. Her actual brother, Satoshi. He was in a position to protect her far, far better than we ever could. That was the cold, sad truth of the massive gulf between Satoshi and us. Satoshi left home. I didn't know why. Maybe it was because of Oyashiro-sama's curse, or he disappeared, or something. In any case, he wasn't beside Sadako now. At the time, Sadako needed him to protect her most. He wasn't here. どうして今ここにいないんですか一番守ってやらなければならないこの時に親城様の祟りがどうとかいろいろ言われてますが家でしたとしか言えませんある日を境に帰ってこないって仲間が言ってました妹の祟子に書き置き一つ残さずに家出
so that she could show him she wasn't ashamed. I asked Coach, but I knew he wouldn't be able to answer. In any case, Satoshi ran away. He left Sadako and ran away from Hinimizawa. Someone said that when you leave Hinimizawa and run away, Oishira-sama's curse gets you, right? Then, that made sense. Satoshi running away and his disappearance. That would obviously mean people thought it was the curse, right? And they could smile. As though it was his own fault. As though he got what he deserved. Hey, Oyashiro-sama, whoever you are. Satoshi didn't vanish because he ran away. You demoned him away with your curse, didn't you? If that's not what happened, then I couldn't forgive him. Satoshi,いつ頃逃げ出したんですか?去年の渡流市のお祭りの夜、おばが異常者に殺されて、その数日後の佐渡子ちゃんの誕生日にです。Maybe, um, uh, this is a little bit of a stretch, but I'm wondering if Satoshi, he took out all his savings and he paid, like, some, the druggie or whatever, like, I'll pay you to go and kill the ants so that Sadako will be free, though he, he couldn't have thought that the uncle would just disappear after, that would run away. So that's a little bit of an outlandish thing for me to think. I'm just like, I'm just thinking, I'm like, I wonder if there's any connection there. Sadako no... As like a fucked up, like, happy birthday, Sadako. Uh, I, I paid someone to kill our aunt so that uh, you could have a better life. <laughs> Bang. I slam my hands onto the dashboard in front of me with all my might. Satoshi, of all the days, he could have chosen to run away. Their aunt just died a few days before, didn't she? All your days of suffering were about to end, weren't they? You were just about to start thinking about a new life, weren't you? It's wrong to be happy about someone dying, but for Sadako and her brother, her birthday had come at a critical turning point. Their mean uncle had fled town, and the siblings would be left alone. They should have been able to be happy about that. On Sadako's birthday, Sadako was probably waiting for her brother to return the whole time. Waiting for her brother to return when he never did. Waiting with bated breath for her brother to return her hopes and dreams of a new life to come growing even larger. But no matter how long she waited, he didn't come back. He didn't even contact her. Sadako, trembling in anticipation of a great present. Just when? When would she have to face the cold, terrible truth? Satoshi, you fucking idiot. I could feel my blood rising to my head and my anger at Satoshi. I was frustrated. I was aggravated. I couldn't forgive him. Sadako still respected and adored her brother, and yet he so heartlessly betrayed her. Such a person wouldn't just come back, now when he was most needed. No one would protect her, not even her real brother, Satoshi. だから、あなたがニーニーだと認めてもらえて嬉しかったです。私もサトコちゃんの幸せを祈る一人ですが、社会的立場があり。日中は仕事をしているみです。私の分まで、サトコちゃんの力になってあげてほしい。そう願っています。そんなことは監督だって。もちろん、年期のある私だからこそできる助けだって色々あると思います。同じように、あなたにしかできない助けだってあるということです。私たちは互いにそれを全う
as a doctor, isn't he, I mean, I don't know if the laws are different in Japan or back then, but uh, what are they called? Like, um, it's like teachers, when you suspect that there is uh, abuse, you have to report it. Like, wouldn't he be in that position where he has to report something, he saw something, and wouldn't he be trusted because he's a doctor? I thought back to when I argued with Mion and the others about Sadako. Our children's argument had only left us with the conclusion that we had to wait and see. But what would an adult think? Coach didn't answer me. I didn't know why he didn't. It was clear as day Sadako's uncle was being violent and treating her like a slave. So then why? I clamped down on my frenzied emotions and waited intently for Coach to answer. But he never did. It wasn't like he was pretending he hadn't heard me. If I had to say, it was more like he wanted to explain, but he couldn't put it into the right words. Oh, I, my thinking was maybe she just didn't want to leave her childhood house. And put into, you know, like, I guess a foster home or something with people she doesn't know. And maybe the other reason too is like if she's placed with a foster home or she's placed somewhere else and Satoshi does come back someday, he would go to their house and then he goes and she's not there and, you know, they wouldn't be able to find each other. I'd known for a while that Satoshi had always protected Sadako from their aunt and uncle. But that was his duty as an older brother, not something to worry about. And for Sadako, the current situation was a retelling of the story of a little over a year ago. But this time, Satoshi wasn't here. Now that he mentioned it, Sadako had never said a word about how hard it had been before. I figured she was being threatened not to talk about it, but... サトコ Coach nodded quietly. たぶん、サトコちゃんに通報の話をすると、とても嫌がるか、その必要はないと強がりを言うと思います。サトコちゃんに内緒で通報したとしても、福祉士に対して、自分は虐待を受けていないと言い張るでしょうね。My God, this is getting some real shit territory. Like just this stuff happens, you know, abuse victims. I can't say I speak from, you know, from first-hand experience, but that seems to be the thing that you hear over and over is abuse victims. They internalize it. They think it's their fault. They don't want other people to know. They're ashamed. They lie. You know, if people, do, you know, social workers come to check up on them because they're afraid the abuse will worsen or they think they deserve it. Oh, this is just too real. I miss, like, the supernatural shit because at least that stuff, I'm like, okay, this stuff doesn't happen in real life. I, I, this does, and this is upsetting. Sadako always acts tough and doesn't readily admit defeat, so I could imagine that easily. 
当事者の許可も一切不要で緊急措置ができる強い権限があるんだそうです虐待が公然の事実なら聡子ちゃんが否定しても身柄は強制的に保護されるでしょうそれは聡子ちゃんにとっては負けか勝ち負けの問題じゃないですよ聡子は現実に話を折りますが身柄が保護されると所定の施設に送致されますそうするとですねそこで暮らすことになるのでつまり引っ越しということになりますですから学変更で転校にもなりますて転校は仕方ないですそれであいつが保護されるなら聡子ちゃんはその辺の事情も知っていますだからますます保護を望みませんどうしてあの家でサトシ君の帰りを待つのがサトコちゃんの家でああ、oh, that's what I said She's still waiting for Satoshi 兄に捨てられた少女が何に生きる理由を見出したかあなたのでなくサトコちゃんの価値観で考えてあげてくださいえっとうん I felt like he was trying to confuse me with that hard to understand roundabout way of talking, so unique to adults. The point was, I couldn't do anything about Sadako wanting to stay in that house, and that I should watch until she gives in. In the end, no matter what I said, Coach himself was saying to wait and see. I don't understand. I That's the Keiichi way. Like, I do what I want. So, no, Kekka. Satoko a fkaina o moyo ste. Ore o uramu koto ga aru kamo shire nai kido. Even though literally everybody is telling me not to do the thing, I'm gonna do the thing. Sai shu teki niya sore ga Satoko no shiawase ni tsunagaru to shinjimas. Coach turned to me and gazed fixedly into my eyes. It was written all over his face. He was shocked at what such a young kid had said. Do ste. Anata wa soko made. Coach, no, rather normal adults might not have understood. So I taught him the creed and the values I believed in. Satoko is my brother, and I am Satoko's brother. Then, do you have any reasons? I stared at him with a will strong and unbreaking as steel in his eyes betrayed a tiny bit of unrest. No. We were silent for a little while, until finally, Coach said only that. えっとすみませんえっとサトコを絶対に泣かせないって We made a vow on that day of the barbecue party I didn't think about it hard at all but coach and I still made a promise Oh the barbecue the last good day of Keiichi's life it seems That we wouldn't ever let Sadako cry and the last good day of Sadako's life too I suppose Coach gave a dry grin of regret, immediately apologizing for not remembering. One way or another, when he grinned like that, it made me think that his enthusiasm for saving Sadako was a tiny bit smaller than mine. He lightly hit the brakes, made a skidding no、uh, nose, and leaned forward. Before I knew it, we were almost to my house. Oh, that was tough. That was tough. And it's just gonna get worse. It's always gonna get worse. <laughs> Alright, case 31. December 1st, 1981. Prefecture Juvenile Welfare Division Report. Do not view, do not duplicate. Case 31, November 20th. Sadako Hoju, blank years old. Residence, blank Hinamizawa Village, Shishibone. Consultation circumstances. Anonymous telephone SOS of child abuse. Abuse situation. Anonymous claims that a female child is suffering physical abuse by adoptive parents, her guardians. 
Family structure, circle marks abusers. Adoptive father, adoptive mother, older brother, child in question. Note, in June 1980, the child's parents died in an accident and she was given to her uncle on her father's side, her father's younger brother. Child Consultation Center's response. On the day of the anonymous telephone consultation, the center called the child's school and asked of her situation. The next day, the welfare officer on duty visited the child's home and heard what they had to say. Both adoptive parents agreed to the center's coaching. Contacted Anti-Abuse Network in the city. As part of the suggested coaching, a district welfare officer in the area began visiting for coaching at fixed intervals. A scrawled note below is stable to the report. Related information for former uh, official Mr. W. Refer to 1977 document D23 number 44. Ask Chief Investigator F from the Child's Education Co uh, Consultation Offices. He is well informed about it. All right, not really too much information there, but I'm guessing we're going to get more and more of these case files and it's going to kind of give us a bigger picture about things. I went home and washed the day's sweat off in the shower. Normally, I could reset everything by taking a shower and forgetting all the bad things. But that didn't happen today. I got out of the shower to find fresh underwear placed neatly in the laundry basket. Normally, I didn't stop to think about it, but today I felt happy at my mother's consideration. At the same time, however, it made me realize how much Sadako must be suffering. At the very moment I was appreciating this gentle kindness, Sadako might be being bruised by her uncle's cruel words. I went up to the second floor and shut myself in my bedroom. Then, facing my desk, I folded my arms. My topic of thought, of course, was Sadako. We thought that if we could just get a public agency to intervene in the right way, the problem would be solved. But with what Coach said, I didn't think it would be so easy. Sadako was obstinate, and she would stubbornly deny the abuse and try to endure it. And that was an act of atonement towards Satoshi, who had protected her before and then run away. As long as she thought that way, the situation wouldn't be so simple. But earlier, before Coach, I made a clear declaration. If I thought Sadako was in danger, then I would do what I had to. In the end, that meant I was just going to wait and see, too. Nevertheless, I thought I'd draw a clearer line than Coach or my friends had. If the time came, I would report it. Over the phone. Given Sadako's personality, she might criticize me if she found out. But I believed it was ultimately the best decision. Wait, Keichi Maibara. Will that really be all it took for the problem to end? Say that I reported it to a public agency like the Child Consultation Center. What if they stuck to their wait-and-see attitude like last year again? Last year, they decided to do just that, and the situation improved temporarily, but then the aunt, thinking herself a laughingstock, increased her tormenting in secret. In the end, things became more underhanded than ever before. This year it was her uncle. I had just seen him for the first time today, but the man seemed much more direct, much more violent than the word underhanded could imply. He wasn't like their aunt. No, not that subtle. He was more direct. He might also assault her with punches and kicks. That could easily be discerned by the bruises and such I saw in Sadako's body. Shit, you're too naive, Keiji Maibara. However heroic it might seem to report what was happening, if it doesn't save her, then it doesn't mean anything. Reporting things to a public agency was only one option, and leaving everything to them would be dangerous. We would need something more to guarantee Sadako's safety. I scratched madly at my head, thinking, then tilted it back, waiting at least, uh, wanting at least a little bit of calm. The memories of angry arguing with my friends today came to mind. I was embarrassed I hadn't realized it until Rena said something. She was right. My house is big. Compared to all the houses with the straw-thatched roofs in Hinemizawa, it was really big. We did actually have empty rooms. I've never thought that we were affluent, but also never that we were poor. I just didn't admit it because people would think I was arrogant. But maybe my family really is wealthy. We had a few rooms we could lend to Sadako. The guest rooms are only in use when people related to my dad's job come and stay every once in a while. Plus, if we cleaned up a few of the rooms my dad used for storage, they could work for her as well. 
As for food expenses, that might be a more serious problem than a kid like me can imagine. Lunch every day would be manageable. All of our friends would just have to bring a little bit more food than they usually do. With everyone pecking at everyone else's food anyway, it would be manageable. For breakfast and dinner, though, that would be up to Mom. I would need to convince her to lend Sadako more than just a room. Of course, I don't even think convincing her of that would be easy. About how much did it cost for one person to eat? How many tens of thousands of yen per month? They couldn't complain about it if I shoulder that, could they? I only had 10 or 20,000 yen in savings, but it was something. I actually had even more thanks to New Year's gifts and such, but my parents had taken all that and put it into a fixed time deposit. If I could get access to it, it should add up to a lot of money. And if I got that far, Mion and Rena would need to share some of the burden. Of course, that didn't seem like it would work. Rena got mad at me, didn't she? About how I shouldn't just shove responsibility onto others. I'd have to ask for help. Even so, I'd basically be saving her myself. I would follow through on it. But it wouldn't be only food expenses. There was a lot of other things you couldn't do without, like baths and laundry. My mother was awfully methodical and strict about cutting out in inefficiencies, and for once that was troublesome. She might even make reference to the money it would cost for the, the detergent Sadako would use for her own clothes. I couldn't think only about food expenses. I needed more money. Wait, Keiichi Maibara, since when was all of this about money? Even if you could afford it, you would need your parents' permission first. They'd be looking after a young girl for a really long time. What would I say to persuade them? Just calm down a little bit, Keiichi Maibara, and you'll realize right away you can't. Even if you ask them seriously, they would tell you to call the police. Even if you manage to gain their empathy, why should the Maibara family have to shoulder all the burden by itself? That's what would happen. That was it. It was very sad and frustrating, but no matter how much I wanted to help, my resolution alone couldn't save anything. I felt frustrated. I believed my feelings were stronger than anyone else's. I even thought they were stronger than coaches. And yet... At that point, there were two knocks on my door, and uh, Mom poked her head inside. Uh, um. As someone financially dependent on his parents, I shouldn't say this, but I just sat around doing nothing and food suddenly appeared. It felt so natural to me I'd shamelessly thought of it as the responsibility of the parents who gave birth to me. But when I realized that natural thing was actually a privilege, I came to realize just how hard it was to grant that privilege to others. Even the boring meal in front of me, no better than it ever was, had more meaning than that tonight. There's food for three on the table right now. For Dad, for Mom, and for me. I couldn't imagine how hard it would be to add another place at that table. Thank Keiji, my Bara. If it was hard to make food for four, then just think about how four people could eat more food made for three. Oh. I changed around the way I thought, and with that, I began to consider an unthinkably bold plan, of course. Just like Keiichi. That's right. I didn't need to get my parents' permission. She should just live here in secret- Oh, oh, Keiichi. Oh, man. He was being so thoughtful, he was thinking things through very, um, realistically and practically, and then he's just like, I'm gonna hide this little girl in our house. I got upset when I found out a while ago, but if I remembered right, if you climbed out the window, then shimmy down the first floor of the gutter, you could go in and out of the house directly from my room. Oh, so he's just gonna- yeah, okay, okay, that- that'll work. Okay, Ichi. Sadako's physical abilities uh, far surpass my own, so it'd be even easier for her. So we're basically gonna kidnap this child and hide her away. I hadn't even thought about it, but her living here secretly was actually a necessity. I'd only have to bring Sadako to my house when the public agency said they would wait and see. In other words, if Sadako's uncle continued to be her guardian. If, in such a situation, word got out she was here, her uncle would barge in and drag Sadako back with him. Her uncle was her rightful guardian, so my parents would hand her over without an argument, no doubt. So I needed to keep it a secret she was living here. If it needs to be a secret, then having my parents help would mean a lot, but you gotta deceive your allies first, like they always say. Okay, 
Persuading my parents was an unrealistic proposition, so I'll search for a way to have her live here in secret. Okay, so he's going through with this. When I was around, she would just have to be really quiet in my room on the second floor. The issue was the daytime. If she was hiding from her uncle, she shouldn't go to school. It might be lonely, but not going would be the better option. I could easily teach Sadako the stuff she learns in her grade. Oh, God. It just gets worse and worse the more he talks. It was like, okay, she's not going to go to school. I'll homeschool her. I'll keep her in my room. All day. And she'll totally agree to this. Actually, during school, I mostly help all the younger kids out rather than study my own stuff. During the day, I would need to go to school so I wouldn't be at home. My parents respected my privacy now that I was this age, so they wouldn't go snooping around in my room while I was gone. Yeah, your parents, exactly, I think. Parents say that, but do they really? When you're not around, do they really not go in your room? Come on. He's being naive. If she holed herself up in my room, it would be okay, right? If my parents did come thanks to where the second floor was, she could hear their approach from the sound of them coming up the stairs. And there would be a little bit of time before they got all the way up, I estimate a few seconds, that she would be able to hide herself in the closet. Wait, wait, Keiji. Something doesn't make sense. You think? Just one thing? If she can't go to school, then what will she do for lunch? Calm down already. I could just leave her my own lunch, couldn't I? I should just go to school without lunch and get everyone else to split theirs with me. Okay, that's good. I was waiting for him to be like, no, this is stupid, I shouldn't do this. It was just like, no, what is she going to do about lunch? <laughs> no more contradictions or oversights, right? Yep, yep, you got it, KG. Everything, this is airtight. This is a perfect, perfect plan. Oh, breakfast and dinner. I could somehow get her to go without breakfast. I can go with two meals a day when I sleep in on Sundays, after all. Every night I pretend as though I had a bigger appetite, then ask for a bigger helping. And then I could just somehow give part of that to Sadako. So you're holing her up in one room all the time. Like, it's it's like Mion said, she's not a pet. He's treating her like she's an animal. Like, oh, well, she can go without food for, you know, for one meal. As a test, I sit up from my seat with my plate of fish in my hands. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hey, wait. I only tried to take away one plate of fish, and they ganged up on me? In reality, it was impossible for me to smuggle food away without my parents knowing about it. But it, it must have been worth taking the time to think about. There must be some trick, some method to avoid them realizing. Even if I can't think of one today, I might think of one tomorrow. My appetite was rapidly fading, so I finished early and went back to my room. I went back there and tried to think about it from Sadako's point of view. Thank you, Keiichi. Yes, it's like you're thinking about it from your point of view, but would she appreciate this? For example, let's say my parents were coming up the stairs right now. I've got to hide. I opened the closet. Clatter, clatter. It didn't open quietly. Hey, wait. Didn't it always open real smooth and quiet? Why was it suddenly doing this now? What is this, a faulty house? Had it already gotten old or something? Or was I just not putting enough work into it? Could I just plaster it with wax? The sound itself may have been soft, but it left me uneasy as to whether my parents would detect it happening when they climbed up the stairs. But this was an easy problem. I could do something about it. See, this is a problem. He's, once he's stuck on something, he, he just latches onto it and he's like, I almost feel like he's already kind of descending into madness a little bit. Like, he's talking crazy. I just had to fix it up a little bit so it didn't make noise anymore. For now, I'll close myself in the closet as though I successfully hid. I basically always left my futon out on the floor. I couldn't think of any real reason my parents would want to go into my closet. Even so, there still might be some reason they would. I might need to construct some sort of camouflage so she wouldn't be noticed even if they did open it. But the more she worried about that, the less time she'd have to actually hide, meaning it would be more likely they'd hear a noise. And then I suddenly had to go to the bathroom. The bathroom? The need to use the toilet, so obvious and yet such a fatal flaw. The only bathroom was on the first floor. It would be absolutely impossible for her to use it without my family realizing. 
I might need to set up a portable toilet, like a chamber pot, I guess. Oh my god, Keiichi. Sadako would hate it, so she could go into my room. But the stench would be pretty terrible. Anyone sensitive would probably notice the smell without even coming into the room. The bath was okay, though. She could just take a bath when my parents were out. When I couldn't do anything about a toilet. When her stomach started to hurt, if my parents were lazing around downstairs, she'd be in trouble. It was then I noticed that I'd been clawing at my head with both hands. I sat down in the dark closet with my knees against my chest. I buried my face into them and tore at my hair. The more I thought, the more contradictions popped up. The more I thought, the more things failed. And the more I worried, the more I was reminded of how little power I actually had. My back started to hurt from staying in a cramped space for too long. But if I was to shelter Sadako, I would need to force her to feel this pain. To live in such a dark, narrow, suffocating place. Forever. But it would still be better than being abused by her uncle. Or so I wanted to think. It got hard to breathe, so I gave in and crawled out of the closet. I looked at the clock, and to my surprise, it was 3.30 in the morning. Keiichi is losing his goddamn mind right now. It had felt like so little time, but it was so unbelievably long. When I realized that, I was slammed with a terrible urge to sleep as if the time had only just caught up with me. I didn't have enough strength to fight it, and I fell flat onto my futon. Shit, I can't just go to sleep like this. If I waste any time, that'll mean I'm taking the same wait-and-see attitude that Mion and Coach and everyone else did. He's literally going to forego sleep so he can think up a crazy plan. I needed to keep worrying about how to rescue Sadako for a minute, or even a second longer than everyone else. Isn't there a better way? Isn't there a better way? So, so all the times that, you know, with these previous chapters, you know, it's like there was some sort of outside force here. The enemy is himself. He's driving himself insane. That one phrase I spoke to myself swirled around around in a spiral and steadily took over my entire mind. For my last moment of consciousness, I thought, there was a lot of blind spots in what I considered tonight, but I absolutely wasn't wrong for having those ideas. Tomorrow I would suggest this bold plan to the others. Mion might be able to help somehow, and Rena was really sharp, so she might have a good suggestion. Or they're all going to think you're insane. And above all, we needed to rescue Sadako once again, with everyone helping out. I felt pathetic for letting myself fall asleep. I'm sorry, Sadako. Like, it's noble of him, but at the same time, like, my goodness, he is going crazy right now. The ceiling blurred into view. It was hot. There was a thin layer of moist sweat on me. The voices of the cicadas permeating in my room was somehow grating to my head. I remember today was a weekday and quickly brought myself to consciousness. And then finally I leapt out of bed. The clock read a little before ten. I was totally late. When I wandered downstairs, my mom would get mad at me. There was nothing I could do, though. After reviewing the schedule for the school day for a moment, I suitably rearranged the stuff in my bag. There's gotta be a reason that the mom didn't wake him up. Something must have happened, and she decided to let him sleep in. I hurried and got dressed and went down the stairs. <sighs> there was no sign of my parents anywhere. Maybe they went out somewhere together. So that's how it was. My mother had probably woken me up once this morning, but then I fell back asleep without remembering it and my parents, thinking I'd gone to school, left. Something like that probably happened. I went to the front door, and as I expected, it was locked. Looked like I was right. It was further evidence of my speculation being correct. When I realized my parents weren't here, I suddenly felt less like I had to rush to get to school. There was one portion of breakfast left in the dining room. Probably mine. The milk they'd poured into it had gone warm since a while ago. When I realized how hard it would be to sneak food for Sadako, yesterday I had cried. Well, thinking back on it, food wasn't the only issue in that regard. I wasn't in a position where I could bargain for Sadako by myself anyway. It's such a heavy thing just to save a single person. I'd seen this on TV and comics all the time. Those feel-good words about how you'll save your friends for sure and such. 
Was that why I ran my mouth like that, swearing to save her? Because I wanted to feel good about it? No, that absolutely wasn't true. Because the fact was I couldn't save her. Because I didn't want to think like an adult, like I couldn't do anything but watch. Had Sadako gone to school today? I immediately realized there was uh, that was a meaningless question. Whether or not she did, there wouldn't be a change in the environment she'd been placed in. If I couldn't save her, and no one else could either, then we could only pray for a miracle. <laughs> With a vague goal of getting to school in mind, I sluggishly put on my shoes and stumbled out the front door. I had only overslept by two or three hours, but the sunlight and air felt completely different from how they usually were in the morning. Well, of course they did. Once ten o'clock came around, you could barely call it morning anymore. I didn't feel like walking the same old route to school. I needed to ultimately end up there, but it was like I didn't want to choose the shortest route, the most proactive one, to get to school. Put in a more positive light, maybe I wanted some time to walk by myself and think, or he wants to go to Sadako's house and see if she's there. I had to go to school. Partly, uh, partially to make sure Sadako was safe. But I hadn't come up with any plans yet. Nothing since last night. So the path I took from my house was in the completely opposite direction. If I went this way, I'd pass Rena's house. And the dam site. It would be quite a detour. I calculated how long of a detour it would end up being, then, satisfied with the answer, I started to walk. Rena had brought me to the dam site a few times. One section of it had turned into an unlawful, oversized garbage dump, and Rena really liked going fishing for junk in there. Without that, she'd come off as a completely normal girl, too. I can think of a few other qualities she could do without, but whatever. The view quickly opened up wide and I was hit by a strong wind. And it's been a while since I've been to the dam site. There was no shelter here at this big dam site. Maybe it was a good thing I came here, I thought. At the very least, it was more healthy to think about stuff in a place like this instead of my cramped bedroom. I took a deep breath and filled my lungs with the rich, cold air unique to Hinimizawa. Ring ring. I turned around reflexively. It was a bicycle bell. Considering where I was standing, I don't think they were trying to get me out of the way. They'd rang the bell because they wanted something from me. Oh! Well, hello! It's been a while since I've seen this guy. Hey, excuse me. You're from Hinimizawa, right? Oh, this, this is the first that that's right. This is the first time I've seen him this chapter. Yes, why? I've seen this person around a few times. Right, I remembered. His name, I think, was Tomate uh, Tomatake, a freelance photographer who lived in Tokyo. He would zealously visit Hinamizawa every season to take pictures. Or so Mion and the others told me, I think. I knew where everything was in my head, but explaining how to get there was difficult. I was a little irritated at having, at, at having been bothered for this, but when I realized it meant my detour actually meant something, that feeling faded quickly. Tomatake-san finally appeared to have realized how strange it was for a student like me to be here at this time of day. I smoothly told him not to worry about it, then turned my back and started walking towards the Furude Shrine. Tomotake-san hurried to turn his bike around and came after me. <laughs> what a free-minded freelancer. It was easier for me, too, that he was under the impression. I'm Tomotake, a freelance photographer. I specialize in wild birds and landscapes. I'm still pretty unknown, though. It seemed absurd for him to introduce himself when I was showing him to the shrine, but he gave me his name, so I needed to give mine back. I'm Maibara. Pleased to meet you, I guess. maibara -kun? Pleased to meet you. He seemed like a pretty silly man, but that felt kind of good considering I'd been suffocating with worry over Sadako all night. 
Along the way, Tomitake-san spoke at length to me about how precious the nature in Hinimizawa was and how it was a treasure trove of rare wild birds, despite my not having asked. I wasn't interested in what he had to say, but he seemed to be enjoying himself, so I left him to it. As Tomitaka-san mumbled to himself, he left his bicycle nearby and started to climb the stairs quickly. I didn't have a watch, but as far as my internal clock could guess, it was still a little late in the morning. School wasn't very far from here. Maybe I could kill a little more time until then. With that in mind, I went up the steps in pursuit of Tomitaka-san. When I reached the top of the long staircase, I arrived at the wide-open shrine grounds that were too grand-looking for this tiny village. Tomitake-san. Oh, there he is. It looked like he was supposed to be meeting someone here. Hmm, I wonder who. Then he got lost and ended up being late. He was bowing to a lady who must have been the person he was meeting. And there she is. That lady. I knew her. Ara, Konnichiwa. あれ、なんだ、ケイチ君ついてきたのかい。別にそんなつもりはないですよ。what was I, a celebrity? Well, she did say my name out of nowhere, anyway. I was oddly concerned about what she meant by famous. あら、私の名前はまだ思い出せない。高野美代さんだよ。村の診療所に勤めてる。ケイチ君は健康そうだからあまり病院のお世話にはならないかな。<笑> <laughs> this lady named Takano-san, I kind of didn't remember her. Maybe we'd passed each other on the street a few times, but I was pretty sure this was the first time we talked. Well, this is Hinimizawa. Even if I don't know a person's name, it's not unusual for them to know mine. I glanced at T uh, Takano-san and saw she had a bag and a camera. Now, don't you guys go sneaking into the uh, into the warehouse, because that will not end well for you. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell which of them was ahead in the conversation. Well, they were certainly one couple you wouldn't get tired of watching. Oh, here we go. It does seem like the festival is happening later than usual in the chapter, usually by like you know, the fifth part of this or so. You know, I'm usually at the festival, but... Oh, I just remembered. There was some village festival called Watanagashi or something the day after tomorrow on Sunday. Takano-san <laughs> smiled somehow meaningfully, but didn't tell me what part of a festival to thank Oyashiro-sama needed to be laughed at. Takano-san 
五度目がないと言える方が何の根拠もないと思うけれど I knew what they meant by their whispered exchange. On the day of Watanagashi, a freak death always occurs, which people call Oyashirasama's curse, and a disappearance occurs that people call being demoned away. These strange events have happened four years running, and Watanagashi rapidly approaching the day after tomorrow marked the fifth. Murano Kyutek ni Tatari o Nasu Oyashirasama ka. Kotoshi mo aru toshite. 果たしてその矛を受けるのは誰になるだろうねあ僕はここに来るたびにちゃんとお参りしてお賽銭を入れてる僕じゃないことは確かだよ<笑> Maybe for once Maybe it won't be these two caught up in it Maybe one chapter that's gonna happen あらそう近年のお社様は違法人には特に厳しいって話よ引っ越してきたばかりとはいえ前原君はちゃんと雛見沢に住んでる村人だけど次郎さんは毎年来るだけのただのよそ者さーて今年は見逃してもらえるかしらえひどいな<笑> Tomatake-san was the only one with a pain grin, but we were all smiling, me included. Oyashirasama, the one who used a curse to kill people involved with the dam construction project, one after the next. He killed the dam construction manager, killed Sadako's parents for supporting it, and the next year he even killed her aunt. If the demoning away was part of that curse, then you could add Satoshi to the list of victims. As I thought about it, I realized in the serial freak death incidents, the overwhelming majority had been the, uh, had the last name Hojo. One of these days I'll get her name right. Well, I feel like I'm saying it wrong. Half the deaths and disappearances had come from the Hojo family. The Hojo family lived here in Hinimizawa. Did that mean Oyashirasama punished and cursed them particularly harshly because despite that, they had been in favor of the dam? Satoko's Oji got back to the house. Takano san, who had been enjoying a few words with Tomotake san, was caught unaware by my sudden inquiry. Ah, go me na sai? Ima nante? Ah, yeah. Satoko no Ryoshin ga tatari goro sare te. Oba mo tatari goro sare te. Datara, junban teki niwa. Tsugi wa oji no ban ka na te omotta n desu. Oh, you know Keiji's hoping for it. And then he'll be like, if the uncle's gone, then she'll finally be free. But with our luck, it's going to be Sadako. It's not going to be the uncle who we want to die. It's going to be the one we don't want to die. I hadn't intended to be quite this persistent. But those words, they just float out of my mouth without me thinking about it. That, that could wrap up this entire... Higurashi is just... I said a thing without thinking about it. Right. Oyashirasama's curse. I didn't believe in something so unrealistic, of course. But the fact was that every year, unfortunate accidents and incidents happened to enemies of the village. Like Takano-san said just now, it had happened four times. No one could say there wouldn't be a fifth. ふーん面白い説ね確かに過去の犠牲者を見れば法上性が多いのは事実 OK ホジョ I think that's the way she pronounced it ホジョその延長として考えれば今年はおじが死ぬか消えるかする可能性は否めないわね<笑>もう高野さんは。怒るかもしれない不幸を笑うのはよくないよ<笑>ごめんなさいねでもお社様のたたりは私のライフワークだし<笑> Her life's work What is I mean I know she's studying curses and stuff but that's a weird way to put it Takano-san gave off a mysterious somehow intellectual impression and her life's work was mysterious in its own right She probably really liked inexplicable supernatural phenomenon or something. Takano-san was... I'm curious about Oyashiro-sama. How do you think? 
北条のあの帰ってきたおじがたたりに会う可能性はあら何そのおじさんを殺したくて仕方がないみたいね<笑>そそんなんじゃないです<笑>うーんどうだろうね神様の気まぐれ次第だからね前原君サンタクロースの正体は知ってるはあ I got a strange question all of a sudden and I couldn't immediately answer なーに知らないのパパよみんなの家のパパな,なんだそういう意味ですかそりゃそうですよどんなものの正体だって最終的には人間です Or Keiji saying this anyway, but Takano kind of implied it. I felt like I put that somewhat strangely, but Takano san was not as dissatisfied with that reply as I might have guessed. She's agreeing though. Although this could be a fake out too. I don't know with this game. Damn it. Now, my brother, I'm going to go to the house. 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 Takano san took a step towards me and gazed into my eyes as she asked. Santa Claus was really the parents of every family's children. If lionizing that legend was a corporate tactic to try and profit during Christmas sales, then what was Oyashiro sama, really? Uh, duh. Ah, So she's saying that Oyashiro sama is her life's work and that Oyashiro sama. Or, the, 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 the thing about Oyashiro sama is the work of humans. Is she behind it all? Or, like, is she trying to find out who's behind it all? Like, what? What? She's just so weird. This is the story. Takano san was the story of the s h i w o u l d n t be behind it because she. Died multiple times during you know, these different chapters. Although, people, you guys have told me that I should take these all as their own kind of stories. There is, there might be some sort of connection, some vague connection to it, but for the most part, these are all their own separate stories. Hinamiza no Murabito ga Nanika no Gishki ni Motozi te okonat te iru, Jin i teki sasujin jiken de naika to mite iru n d o Ah, now that I think about it. That's what Shion said in the last chapter, but I can't remember what、uh, Takano's beliefs have been from chapter to chapter. Like, if she believes that too, if it's people, or if she actually believes in, you know, in the deity. Um, I could tell at least she was saying some crazy stuff. If I were to liken her statements to a meal, it would be sort of like she just tried to stuff a whole plate of duck into my mouth and now I couldn't say anything. So, 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 Takano san, having entered her home field, leaned forward and began to speak of ridiculous matters. Tomitake san realized she was overawing me and interrupted for me. Takano san, Takano san, 
その話をいきなり圭一君にしてもほら彼も面食らってるよあらそう続きに興味があったらいつでも言ってね前原君くらいの年頃の男の子が好きそうな猟奇的なお話がてんこ盛りなんだからあありがとうございます気が向いたらそのうちに For now I softly and safely gave my refusal Takano-san seemed a little unhappy that Tomitake-san had rained on her parade, but she stopped talking about it then. Keiji still needs to go to school, I forgot about this. <laughs> Even so, it was still a very interesting story. That Oyoshiro-sama's curse, which we thought of as a strange freak deaths, were really homicides, perpetrated by people of the village. Well, <laughs> そうねそれが誰なのかは<笑>研究しない方が無難ね That's her pointing at Keiichi and be like Keiichi stop getting yourself involved in stuff because it never ends up well for you 高野さんは知ってそうですね証拠はないまでも確信を持っているくらいにはあらどうしてそう思うのかしら I just kind of felt it vaguely. It didn't seem like her extreme passion for this research could be explained just by these things being taboo or being safe and easy. This person loved walking through the profound, forbidden abyss of risks and taboos. She did it. She's behind everything. <laughs> Maybe she's not even real. She's like a figment of our imaginations or something. <laughs> Tomitake san seemed a little disappointed not to be able to go on the date he'd planned since I'd brought up a weird topic. But right now, there was something I wanted to ask, just for a little bit. And that was about whether Sadako's uncle will be chosen for the curse this year. If he was, then another miracle would happen, just like last year. A terrible incident would happen again, but it would release Sadako from her unfortunate circumstances once more. まあ、もちろん、おそらくあの辺りの人たちが関わってるんだろうなっていう憶測は持ってるわよ。鬼ヶ淵村の歴史を研究していれば、自然と至る必然的結末。それは誰です？What would I do if I knew? I asked that question to the other me deep inside, but got no reply. Takano-san toying with Taboo gave me a devilish, satisfied smile, as though nothing in the world would be more amusing. She was probably trying to tease me, but I didn't feel like going along with her little game one bit. Damn, Keiji! I had felt a tinge of irritation at Takano-san's roundabout way of speaking. But those emotions escaped my mouth like water flowing through a strainer, like always! She's like, I've decided it will be you this year. <laughs> Even I was surprised at how directly I'd spoken out about what I felt. Of course, I wasn't the only one taken aback. <laughs> Takano-san's tongue poked out of her mouth, and I was convinced it was a long, thin, and split in the middle like a snake's. Oh, here we go, Keiji. This is what you wanted, and it's probably going to come back and bite you in the ass like it always does. Which means he will. He's gonna do the first thing, he's gonna do the second thing, and he's gonna do the third thing. Zetai 
I gulped firmly and nodded. Tomotake-san made an exaggerated expression of distrust, gave a dry, vague smile and lit a cigarette. And after I said that, I finally realized why I wanted to know. Ah! <laughs> Damn it! And of course we're not going to know. Ah, what a... Damn it. I should have known. Many of my classmates were playing freely in the schoolyard. Maybe he's saying... Maybe it's Sadako. Maybe she wanted... Why would she want her parents to die? And then I can understand why she would want her aunt to die. Or maybe it's Rika. Maybe because Rika is like, you know, the maiden or whatever... It's like maybe she, I don't know, I don't know why she would want Sadako's parents to die. Once again, I would understand why she would want the, the aunt to die. But anyway, those, I'm just spitballing. So anyway, many of my classmates were playing freely in the schoolyard. A few of them had just run out of the school building after putting on their shoes and tapping their toes to the ground. It looked like they had just finished eating lunch. From a time manipulating standpoint, I guess I succeeded. A few girls noticed me and came running over. It was only natural they were worried. You'd think if someone weren't there in the morning, they'd be out the rest of the day. The girls exchanged glances. I saw a thin shadow fall over their faces and knew the answer without needing to hear them reply. Sadako was absent today, too. When all was said and done, after being out three days, she'd only come back for one. And now she was out again. Who knew she would come back tomorrow? <laughs> Wait a minute, Chie-sensei. That's a little too thick-headed, don't you think? You're a teacher, aren't you? Why can't you be more sensitive and catch on to the fact that your pupil is sending out an SOS? But even if she did, there was nothing we could hope for. The most she could do was a home visitation. She didn't have any right to take Sadako from her uncle into safety. No matter the result, it would end up just like the public agencies with a wait-and-see attitude. It would just piss Sadako's uncle off, and her, uh, and her suffering would only grow deeper. I wasn't saying she had a cold the best option. The girls excitedly scattered into the schoolyard. <laughs> Rena was yelling out the classroom window, waving her hand. A moment later, Mion and Rika Chan poked their heads out too. I felt a little uncomfortable with her saying I didn't look sick, but I didn't care that much. Mion was being a bit persistent. Was she going to put on her club president cap and scold me for being late? Well, maybe she didn't have it in for me, so I briefly stated that she was right. Maybe they were worried that I had gone and, like, went to Sadako's house to do something. Even Rena, feigning cheerfulness, couldn't stand to hear that, and her face darkened. Oh. 
Oh no, what are you, Keiichi? Don't, don't. I'm worried he's going to get into a fight with them again. Not pleased with Rika-chan wearing a wide smile as though it was a happy occasion. I threw cold water on her. Keiichi, you dumbass. Oh. He just got out of the doghouse and now he's going back. And maybe Rika's smiling because maybe she is the one who is behind determining who dies. At least in this chapter. The last one makes no sense. Especially because she died in the last chapter and then the first one not really. But maybe in this one, maybe she's got some control over it. Marika Chan furrowed her brow, looked down, and mumbled an apology. Please don't let Rana get mad at me again. That was scary. I got the feeling I would cause another fight if this exchange went on. At least he's finally catching on to something. So I apologized first. It was at least clear, however, that I was the only one who had worried so much about rescuing her. At the very least, everyone else probably got the normal amount of sleep last night. Probably had good dreams, too. They definitely hadn't stayed up all night thinking so desperately. It's like he is... He really is kind of going off the deep end. It's like he's getting angry at them that they're not as invested as he is. And that they're not lo literally losing sleep over it. Which I can kind of understand, but I feel like he's just... He's slipping, man. I feel like he's, he's just going to start to resent them more and more that they're not doing more. けいちゃん、Oh, she did probably think that he went to the house. Easy for you to say. He's like, I was thinking about it, but it, it just... The logistics didn't work out. If I could have, I'd have done that last night. None of them had really thought about how difficult that clear-as-day solution was. I was up thinking all night, thinking until the night was brightening. And then, I concluded that I couldn't do anything of the sort. I love that he, sh she was kind of half right. He was thinking about it. And if he, if he could have felt that it would have worked, he would have. I took my bento box out of my bag. Everyone moved to make a spot for me to sit. And just as I was about to stick my chopsticks in, Chie Sensei came along. What the heck? Even the teacher was giving me that strange look. It's like they all think that he did something with Sadako. Oh, I wonder if Mion told Chie, like, I think that Keiichi might have done something. Probably about Sadako, I thought. Sensei left it at that and went back out into the hallway. Mm. Mion and I exchanged looks, nodded to each other, and got up. No doubt about it. They were saying she had a cold, but everyone in class knew the truth. I didn't think that wouldn't have reached the teacher's ears by now. Revealing the truth to the teacher would only worsen the situation. Was that why she hadn't said anything? Or was it because she was Sadako's friend? 
and knew that she was trying to endure the trial of her uncle's abuse in order to get her brother to come home. <laughs> no, Sadako's closest and best friend was Rika-chan. However much I pretended to be her nini, it didn't come close to the amount of time they'd spent together. So I felt like her opinion should be held in the highest regard. Everyone looked startled and turned to me. きっと泣きながら兄の背中に隠れてた。でも結局そのせいで兄が逃げてしまったんだと佐藤は思ってる。誰に聞いたのかな。監督か。I nodded quietly. 佐藤は叔父のいじめに耐えれば兄が帰ってくると信じることによって今を耐え抜こうとしているのかもしれない。でも。Everyone hung their heads. Everyone was thinking the same thing. Satokua I told them all about what I saw and how I felt when I went to Sadako's house yesterday. Keiichi君は話すべきだと思ってるってことだね。もちろん公的機関への通報で佐藤が保護されるのが確定してからだ。also, I apologize. It seems like the uh, the volume of the voice it kind of dips sometimes. I'm not doing anything; it's just doing it itself. So I apologize for that. I had no confidence, but we had to try. Meanwhile, Rika-chan had her hand raised for a while, as if asking for an opportunity to speak. Keiichi-ni,任せますです。え、いいのかい、リカちゃん。Keiichi-wa,ここにいる誰よりも、サトコのことを考えていますです。その、Keiichi-が、話すべき時だと判断したなら、ありがとう。ミオもレナも、それで
何か知っていますかクラスでよくない噂をしている人たちがいます。ミオン looked down and remained silent as though she was being lectured. She sent me a quick glance. Everyone had made up their minds. They'd been leaving things to me. 委員長前原君も先生は別に怒ってるんじゃありませんよもしも知っていたら教えてほしいとお願いしているだけです先生先にこっちから質問してもいいですか She must not have anticipated that response. She looked surprised. クラス中で佐都子のどんな噂が飛び交ってるかは知りませんが仮にその噂が真実だったとして先生はどうするつもりですかどどうするもこうするもその話が本当なら放っておけません放っておけないって具体的にはどう放っておけないんですか先生 e b r o w s shot up Maybe I said it like I was trying to pick a fight. <laughs> That seems to be Keiichi's thing, is like, he just sounds so. I don't know, it, it does sound aggressive sometimes when he's talking to people. Maebara kun, Sensei wa majime ni o h a n a s h i s t e r u n d e s y o Sensei koso, ore a s u g o k a j i m e na h a n a s h i s t e r u n d e s Mazu k o t a i t e k u d a a i s i n j i t a t a t o s t e do h o t o k e n a i n d e s Sensei took a few breaths, then began to speak slowly. まず状況を確かめるために北条さんの家を家庭訪問しますおじに怒鳴りつけられて追い返されるかもしれませんねまあいいや仮におじと聡子に会えたとしますそれでそして真意を聞きますその事実が確認できたなら指導します指導って曖昧な言い方はやめてください具体的には何をするんですか Even despite my tone being so provocative, Chie Sensei bit back her emotions and listened calmly. I thought then that she was a good teacher. Chie Sensei really did have her students' best interests at heart. But she didn't have the power or the authority to save Sadako. If she let her sense of justice run away with her, the situation could get more complex. Sensei folded her arms, and for a few moments she closed her eyes as though mentally concentrating. And when they opened again, There was a strictness in her eyes I'd never seen before. Jidou Fukushi Ho to you, Horitz Garimas. Kono Horitz de Jidou ni Taisur Gaktaiwa, Nan Pito ni Taisur de Mito Merate in Aikoto ga Meki Sareteimas. Lashi des ne. Sore de Okinomia no Sekat Sodan Joe Tsu Hoshimas. Saki, Maebara Kun wa Oikai Sareru to Yimastane. Kono Sodan Joe no Shokuin wa. 必要に応じて警察官を同行させることができます。同活には絶対に屈しません。その福祉士というお役所の人は、連絡して書類で申請して、何日後に助けに来てくれるんです。即日です。彼らの仕事は、児童の安全を緊急に保護することですから。知ってますよ。緊急性があると判断された場合ですよね。認められなかったら、先生と同じ、指導をして、様子見をするんですよね見てるだけ佐都子のおじの機嫌を悪くして佐都子をその場に残したままそれっきりケイちゃんちょっと言い過ぎ嘘はついてないだろう去年だか一昨年だかに児童相談所が来た時がまさにそうだったんだろうその結果どうなった俺よりもミオや先生の方がよっぽどよく知ってるだろうが No, here he goes again. He was doing okay for a while, and now he's letting his emotions get the best of him. I had said too much. I didn't need Mio to tell me that. I was talking crazy and itching for a fight. I was supposed to be telling her about the situation only after I was sure we could save Sadako, but I basically told her everything right from the start. Chie Sensei looked at the clock, stood up, and picked up the phone at the principal's seat. Mushi Mushi. 内線の3455をお願いしますいいのケイちゃん本当に大丈夫かな It was too late The dice had been cast Now we could only pray あお世話になっておりますひなみざわ文庫教諭の知恵と申しますが指導室の渡辺主事はいらっしゃいますでしょうかはいええちょっと休養がございまして
至急校長と連絡が取りたいのですがはいお願いします緊急とお伝えくださいよろしくお願いします The teacher put down the phone and tilted her head back and took a breath like I always did 二人にもう一度だけ聞きますクラスのみんなの噂は全て本当なんですねはい俺は昨日サトコの家に行って実際にどういうことになっているのか見ましたあとは先生に任せてくださいサトコちゃんはきっと先生が何とかしますなんとかいい加減なことを言わないでくださいケイチジェイズなんとかじゃない絶対でなければならないもしもまた様子見なんてことになったら先生はどう責任を取るつもりですか While I was yelling, the phone rang. Chie sensei snatched the receiver up first. もしもし、あ、研修中申し訳ありません。はい、実は例の北条さと子さんの件でお話が。はい。Sensei waved us away, telling us we could leave now. Mio went to leave, but I held my ground. I had a responsibility to make sure she stopped saying such vague, ambiguous things. If it didn't look like she was going to say anything substantial, Then I tell them the truth, even if I had to steal the phone from her. Oh my gosh, it's really. It's really hard to be on his side sometimes. Hi. Yeah, Mada Sodan Juniwa. Hi. Mada Kakuniwa stay my singer. Class no Kono Hanashidewa. Soto na yos des. Soto na de monja naido. Sumida. Ima sugu nanto da so. Two or sumida da doe da tee. Demona. もしも様子見なんてことになってみろただじゃ済まさないからだ !I yelled angrily at Sensei and the principal on the other end. I wanted to somehow, some way, convey to them just how dangerous her situation was right now. それは分かっています。ちゃんと伝えますから。院長、前原君を連れて教室に戻りなさい。あ、はい。行くよ、ケイちゃん。あとは先生たちに任せよ。絶対、だぞ。Until the very last moment, I glared at Sensei. Shie Sensei was being pressured by the likes of me. Idiot, this isn't the time to feel pressured. Now's the time when you give me a firm nod that'll set my mind at ease. Even so, we've already left things in her hands. At this point, we really can't do anything but pray. See, I'm afraid he's already kind of like slipping a little bit. I'm afraid that it's exactly as he says it's going to happen. They're not going to take her away. Things are going to get worse. She might end up dying. Keiichi's going to go absolutely insane. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just this. It feels like, yeah, we're on the cusp of something now, and I'm afraid of what's going to happen. Bang. Neon shut the door to the teacher's lounge. Alright, well, I guess we will just have to wait and see ourselves, won't we? Alright, so before we wrap things up, as always, let's check out the new tips. So we've got article and statistics from the Ministry of Health and Welfare. Article 2 Definition of Child Abuse The term child abuse means the following acts committed by a custodian. Meaning a person who exercises parental authority, a guardian of a minor or other person who is currently engaged in the custody of a child, here and after, the same shall apply. Against a child, meaning a person who is under 18 years of age, here and after, the same shall apply. 1. Assault the child in a manner that will cause or is likely to cause external injury on the body of the child. 2. Engage in indecency against the child or cause the child to engage in indecency. 3. Substantially reduce the amount of food for the child or abandon and neglect the child for a long period in a manner that may interfere with normal development of the child mentally or physically or otherwise mater、uh, materially fail to perform the duty of a custodian or 4. Speak or behave in a manner that would be significantly traumatic to the child. Article 3. Prohibition of Child Abuse. No person shall abuse a child. Law Number Act No. u m b e 82 of 2000. Authored by the Ministry of Health and Welfare.
So I believe uh, someone has mentioned in the comments in one of my videos about how the creator of this game actually worked, I believe, in social services, and that's why he has so much knowledge about this and it's really going in depth about it. Which is even sadder, knowing that this probably is inspired by something that, you know, he saw or heard about. Year 19 blank. Principal abusers in cases reported to the Ministry of Health and Welfare. Aww. Total 5,352. Mother by blood. 2,943. 55%. Mother not by blood. 203. 3.8%. I guess it's a whole thing. It's like, you know... It, the, these are all statistics or such big numbers and you kind of get lost of it and then they show Sadako who's this character that we care about and she's just one of all of these children, you know. Father by blood, 1,445, 27%. Father not by blood, 488, 9.1%. Year 19 blank. Instances by type of abuse in cases reported to the Ministry of Health and Welfare. Total, 5,352. Physical abuse, 2,780, 51.9%. Neglect, abandonment of child, 1,728, 32.3%. Psychological abuse, 458, 8.6%. Forbidden from going to school, 75, 1.4%. Sexual violence, 311. <gasps> oh. The way that the, the the noise is going off there when they're saying sexual violence. Oh, fuck. Fuck. It hasn't been implied yet. It's been all the physical and mental. But that little sound there, is that the game telling me that the uncle sexually abused her? Because I'm gonna fucking lose my mind. Oh my god. I'm like, legitimately, like, upset by that. All right, guys, so we are going to leave it on that really cheerful uh, end there. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. That last little bit is just making me even more like, oh, I don't want to continue, but I'm going to continue because I want to know how this is going to go. Not great, I'm assuming. So yeah, once again, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.